it's Rich Wellington from richwellington.com and you are listening to the Transformative Sales Podcast. And today I am joined by Johnny Collins from johnnycollinsuk.com, optimal male consultant. Uh, Johnny, come say hello to everybody. How you doing, everyone? Well, they're doing awesome because they're listening to us. <laughs> oh, I appreciate you having me on board. It's, um, it's good. Yeah, no, honestly, ple- pleasure's mine and everyone else that's listening. Um, Johnny and I have actually, you know, known each other and been friends for, you know, for a good few years now. So uh, usually, you know, before I, before I hit record and, you know, we get going, I've, you know, I spend a bit of time, you know, speaking to people and finding out who they are and what do they do in the world. And I get people to fill out a form and stuff. But, um, you know, we know each other so well, we're ready to just red light this thing uh, and get going so exactly exactly so i'm really i'm really excited for everyone to hear about you know your journey uh in life not just you know the last few years you know with business and stuff uh you know to basically bring us up to present day so i'm gonna i'm gonna shut up i'm gonna hand you the microphone and just allow you to introduce yourself and give everyone a little bit of a backstory yeah sure um so i'm johnny collins as rich said uh, I'm from Froome, a little town in the southwest in Somerset. Um, I joined the military at just uh, as soon as I turned age 19, and it was awesome. Absolutely loved it. Um, finally, I suppose the majority of my business now is about fitness and discipline. So I guess that was the first introduction to both of those things because um, I wasn't introduced to it all that well in uh, my younger years. <laughs> um, uh, and then throughout the military, really enjoyed it. It was awesome. It was great. Found a p- real passion for fitness and pushing myself physically, um, challenging myself, just kind of living a living an above average lifestyle. That's what I enjoyed the most. I felt like I was always progressing, always doing something different. Um, then due to unforeseen circumstances where I was faced with a decision, basically just a very small injury that doesn't affect a lot at all, except for one minor test. Um, I got some pins put through my wrist and it basically meant that I couldn't do one flat handed press up at the on my knuckle, which affected my medicals on pushing forward and doing more arduous courses. So I thought, right, I can either stay where I am in the military and kind of know that I'm being held back or I can leave now. I've done six years. Um, I'm still young enough to do my own thing and start something completely new. Uh, and it was terrifying. It was fucking scary, but I just, I just did it left. Um, uh, this is quite the typical <laughs> a guy leaving the military of no no qualifications except for half a carpentry qualification. Um, this is a standard thing: is security or personal training. That is that is it. That is that's, like you speak to any uh, military guy leaving with no quals. That's what he's going for. So that's exactly what I did. Yeah. Or, or both. Okay. No, that's exactly me. I was like, I'm doing both. Doors on a nighttime PT through the day. That is exactly <laughs> what I did. Uh, I had loads of guys in the security business anyway, um, guys that put me on the doors straight away, had me doing festivals. It was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I didn't love it. It was just obviously like just good laugh with the lads. You're still part of a close-knit team. Uh, thought I'd drag that passion into personal training. Um, so I did that. But it's just, I realized very quickly when I kind of ran the numbers and I was just like, shit, if, like, this is this is this is me now. Like, where do I go from here? Cause I I struggled to sort of get started at a gym and I did build it very, very quickly. Um, my PT, the company naming me as the top PT in Bristol within a very short amount of time. Um, but it was, it's very competitive. Um, and also it's hit and miss whether you'll get to do what you're passionate about. Like I was a young fit guy, um, loved like packing on muscles, stripping fat, getting elite level fitness. That's what I enjoyed getting guys to do. So when I had a heavy, older person with kind of more superficial goals or just, just fucking boring stuff, um, I could help them and I did help them, but I didn't have that real passion for it. And then I'd get a young guy that'd be like, I want to join the army. Um, will you help me do it? And I, I, every time his session was coming up, I was pumped for it. So it was hit and miss. Um, so I didn't love it, uh, but mainly because I didn't, as far as I was concerned, that was, that was me. Like I was taking sessions. Um, and hopefully as I built the business, I'd have more sessions. That's it. It's far too simple, far too basic. Um, I didn't know anything about business at all. Uh, and that's when I first spoke to you. Um, 
which was, and I remember it perfectly because I was in Guildford at Amber's house. Amber's my girlfriend who I live with now. Um, and we had a, we spoke for hours. I think it was like two and a half, three hours. Um, and we just dived in deep. I mean, you taught me so much stuff about how, mainly about the mindset part of uh, having a business and how, I was, how you need to be creative and think outside the box and sort of focus on, like my focus was get sessions. And that's where I was held back. So I thought, shit, if I move house and start a different gym, I'm just starting again, like from scratch. I didn't know how to build a brand, a business, uh, uh, passive income, anything like that. I didn't really know how to 100% have a huge effect on someone's lives. I was just get, giving blokes six packs and broader shoulders and getting rid of birds' tummies. Like, that's it. It's pretty boring. Um, but then, yeah, I remember you helped me um, to a point where I think it was... <laughs> three or four, like either tripled or quadrupled my income and hired some other guy to take my sessions, which was my first mistake, actually. Um, got very excited about financially being able to hire someone else to do the, the sort of legwork, the coaching of my semi-private groups. And he t I just hired too quickly. It was awful. Um, I mean, it should have been a red flag where he asked me to sort his diet out for him. So like, hang on, this guy's meant to be a trainer. <laughs> this thing's not right here. Um, and also just kind of always asking for tips on training and stuff. And I was happy to do it because I enjoy helping people, but I was, I wouldn't like admit to myself that it was a big mistake. Uh, I've recently heard, uh, uh, Vince Reed says hire slow, fire quick. I did it like the opposite way around. Like even when it was obvious, he was awful for this job. Um, I just, I clinged onto it because I was desperate to be that guy who had someone working for him and grew the business. Um, but eventually I just, um, I chinned him off immediately, sent the text. Um, we need to speak. Um, we spoke on the phone and then when I hung up, it was like the weight was just gone off my shoulders. I was just fucking relaxed. Um, it was very good. and just took the jump online, immediately went online, um, and used the same systems. Um, but then the biggest thing, and this is what I put all everything that I do now, cause like, I love my life now, like my business, like it's, it's, perfect with how I live. Um, and it all comes down to niching down because I did the exact same thing as I did in the gym online, helping everyone, um, for, for about a year and a half. And then last year in February, just before I was about to take my dog, Bert, who's lazily sitting down here, um, who you didn't meet actually, I didn't bring him up, did I? Um, I was gonna, no, no, I've, I've not had the opportunity to, uh, yeah, to, to meet Bert yet. We're like when Johnny says, like not, when, yeah, when he says bring up, you know, John, Johnny's, you know, been to ours basically. And, <laughs> and, uh, if you're listening to this, you won't have an appreciation of what's happening right now. However, if you're watching this on <laughs> YouTube or any other platform, you'll have just met Bert. My ginger bearded dog. Um, so yeah, just before I was about to jump in the car and go traveling with Amber and Bert for three months around, just went around like Italy, Switzerland, France, Croatia, just driving all around. I thought, this is not a good time to completely tear your business apart and start again. Um, but I'm definitely going to do it. Um, cause just because I, I wanted to travel, being excited uh, about like a, like loving my business again, like I did when I was in the army. So I did. I tore it all down in February 2018, ripped it to shreds, um, became very particular about who I help. It was literally men who, uh, who want to optimize their testosterone levels. Um, pack on muscles, strip fat, and no easy fixes. I make it very clear in my advertising um, and my whole message, my branding, that this is tough. I even make it tougher when it's unnecessary to because I want to enhance discipline. I want to enhance hardship. I want to make men tougher. And that leads to happier, more positive, more determined, more focused, everything. So now it, it's good because that's how I've always wanted to live. Um, I like picking the hard route. I like enhancing my mindset and becoming more a more disciplined man all the time because I feel like that pushes you forward. So I got to start a business where that was the whole aim of it, helping men completely reach their optimal state physically. Um, and then the side effect of the mental um, optimization that comes with it. So travel around France, uh, building it, got into Switzerland. It was started sort of paying the bills because I was obviously living off my savings for the first month while I built it. Um, and then suddenly it was like something just clicked. And as I, I became much more aware of listening to feedback. So I'd listen to feedback of the business, like these things that guys are saying, like the most common one that I kept hearing was, 
uh, I want to be a better man for my son or a better man for my wife. And I'm just like, yeah, these men are coming from like a really honest place. But that's how I, I need to stop selling this as like, uh, like I'm going to give you the, the body you want and literally showing them what's possible. And I gathered all the testimonials from the guys at the start that I'd helped for peanuts, um, how it's there affected their lives, the guys that came off antidepressants, the guys that um, saved their marriage, the guys that were going through a failed marriage and stopped caring and pushed on with life and now feel amazing, the guys that have joined the military because of it, just all this stuff. Um, I was able to like pack it all together and find out exactly what my target audience wanted um, and build something great. And now, yeah, then I got back home in August um, and just put all my focus in. When you're not driving five hours a day um, and sunbathing, it's a lot easier to get your, um, get your work done. So, um, yeah, and that's where, that's where I am now, really. I just uh, I set, obviously, new goals in January um, just for the business. Um, but it's, it's just carry. I know exactly where I want to be now and I'm just carrying on from there. Wicked. Fucking great, great bit of backstory, Johnny. Great bit of backstory, dude. Thank you. So hopefully, you know, if watching or, or listening, that, that gives you, you know, just a, just a tiny bit, you know, and it's always very difficult to quantify your life, you know, mm. into a few minutes, you know, without go, obviously going into every different strand of emotion. But I'd love to... Um, I'd love to talk about like before the military, right? okay. before the military, because that'll have been the time when you were really becoming solidified with like who you were in the world and, you know, how then that was going to play out into, you know, military life and then leaving and being a business person and stuff. So why don't you give us an idea of, you know, what was, what was life like, you know, when you were a little bit younger? Yeah, sure. I mean, I remember when we first spoke and you, we talked about briefly about this and you said, this is one of the reasons where my, a huge characteristic of mine is being the protector, like just wanting to look after everyone. And that's something that I've realized is actually a trait of a lot of good men out there. So I've built the business on like showing men how they can be seen in that way. But it all came down from, um, I grew up in, I grew up in Froome, um, moved to, it was in a town till about I was 11 and I moved to the countryside, which I loved. I got an insane passion for the outdoors. Like it sounds real cliche, a bit nerdy, but I was just like running around the woods all the time. But um, I think we had, we had a little TV downstairs and a PlayStation 1, which we were allowed on for like half an hour each. There was three of us, me, my brother and my sister. We could have half an hour each um, in, the, in the afternoon or in the evening. And I'd just give my half hour to my brother because I'd just be like, Mum, can I go walk the dog? And I'd take in my fat black lab um, around the woods, um, just loving it. I had one of these little toys with like a binoculars on. I was just like a proper made to be in the Boy Scouts, I guess. Um, but yeah, just loved it. It's always really sporty. Um, loved being active and stuff. At school, um, the only thing I really worked hard at was PE. Just loved being active. Um, and I was from an active family. My mum uh, has ran a lot of marathons. She doesn't anymore. The last one, she walked it. She says she's getting too old to run them. Um, so she walked it. So my dad, um, really awesome rugby player for the Newquay Hornets. Um, and then he went to be a PE teacher, but then um, went off to do some financial stuff. Um, so real sporty family. My brother's an incredible rugby player. My sister's a great dancer. Um, so we've all, we're all really active, but um, I, didn't, I didn't pursue any... Um, any sports seriously, I just kind of liked everything. So uh, I didn't, I mean, I never had my heart set on say like being a professional footballer or like being in the Olympics. I was just, I just liked all stuff. Like if you, if it made you sweat and it hurt your lungs, I was, I was on board. Um, and then after school, um, I, <laughs> I wanted to go to carpentry college. Um, I wasn't, I did all right in school, not too bad at all. I was a bit uh, active. Um, a bit excitable. So there was a few lessons which, despite not being actually allowed in, I did quite well just because I was I was quite a switched on kid, but I just had way too much energy for that. And that actually carried on into Carpentry College where uh, there was a two-year course. Uh, and this is what made me join the army. After one year, my mum got a letter and it says, uh, Johnny is uh, not allowed back to complete the course for the following reasons. Um, and it was just everything, it was everything just because I couldn't focus. I was too excitable. I didn't go to a lot of uh, classes cause I was, uh, just doing my own thing, just enjoying myself. Um, I'd never stay at home. I wasn't a lazy guy. I just, uh, I was real, not anti authority, 
but kind of if I didn't think it was a good idea, no one, no matter how high up above me they were, even my dad will say the same thing. If I didn't think it was a good idea, it would not get done. Um, and that's why when my mum said, what are you going to do now? You can't go back to carpentry college. I said, do not worry, mum. I'm going to join the army. Got it all figured out. Johnny Collins has got it all figured out. Um, and I did. I went to the careers office. I was like, shit, I've actually got to do this now because I don't really have any options. But everyone I spoke to said, you'll struggle with the authority side of things um, because they thought I didn't like authority. They didn't realize that actually I just didn't like doing dumb shit. I didn't like of people in authority telling me to do something that was a dumb idea. Um, so that's, they, like, that, that's that air of, uh, you know, respect because that changes, doesn't it? When you're in the military, because yeah. I, I can totally resonate with that, you know, the yeah. schooling and just like, um, I, don't, I don't mean to sound disrespectful when I say this, but like nobody's telling yeah. you like, how life is. And you're like, how do you know? Well, and I comes down to with my boys. Is that like, yeah. Yeah. Like I'm like, yeah, boys be respectful, you know, to teachers. Absolutely. But most teachers have never actually left school. Mm. go through school yeah. they go through university then they go back to school again most most i'm not saying all but most and then they have a very tunneled vision of how life is and what they, their experience is yeah. so that that i saw that from being very young you know from being sort of you know 12 13 14 15 so i was very much the same as yourself so but that changes right you go into the military all of a sudden you're like these well, people are you want to be real. those guys you want to be yeah. them they're telling you it's in school and stuff maybe it's because I said so now, obviously, I teach guys to live a certain way and I live that way and that's probably why they listen to me. Um, you, these people are telling you what to do and I've always been very aware that I'm like, well, I don't want to have what you've got. I don't want to be who you are. So your advice means nothing to me. <laughs> um, but then you see these, you join the army and you see these guys that have been um, been on tour. They're, they're in good shape. They, they're progressing through the military. These are tough guys. You just And you think, I'm going to listen to you. Because I've joined because I want to be like you. So obviously, advice you're giving me is it comes from a good source, and I can see that. Whereas um, at home, I mean, I've got an older sister and a younger brother, so I was the oldest boy, so I was very much like in charge as far as uh, like the siblings go. Amy, my sister, was the one like barking orders. Matt was the smart one, but I was the one in control. Like uh, <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't ever up to dispute. Like I was the I was the kind of like I remember being. Uh, my brother was very young and he was in band and um, he, we lived in the Stonebridge estate in Froome and it was maybe like a, a mile from the, the school back to our house and my mum just said, um, why don't you go and walk back with Matt? And I was like, he can walk himself. She said, yeah, but he'll be carrying, he'll have his trumpet bag. She said, he'll be carrying his trumpet bag and um, when he walks through the estate, people might pick on him, but if you were with him, they wouldn't think of it. And I used to feel great. I'd be like, yeah, yeah, you're right, mum. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm in charge. And uh, so I used to go and walk him back. And uh, I guess that like just carried it on. Um, feeling, I like to feel in control. I like to feel like I'm the one. I've decided to do what I'm going to do. Um, mm. if, if I'm getting advice from someone, yeah, I want, it has to be because I want what they've got. It can't just be blindly followed. Yeah. So a, cred a credible source that also aligns with your beliefs, your passions, and where you want to go. Yeah, exactly that. Exactly that. Sweet. And that's why I think I found it easier training men than training women, because especially um, like, an o like an older, overweight woman, what have I got in common with her? I felt like a, almost a fraud giving her advice. I knew what she needed to do, but I'm like, I've never been in your position. I'm just telling you what they taught me. Like, this is just a relay of information, and you're giving me money for it. Um, I didn't, in, it wasn't fun for me. Whereas with these men, um, I've, I know exactly what they're going through mentally as well as physically. I know I can say I've done this and this happened. Feels way more authentic, like being a giving and receiving advice if, if, you've, ex, if you've lived it and experienced it. Yeah, exactly. So, again, you know, the majority of people that will be listening to this, there'll be, you know, coaches, consultants, things of that nature. It's so important what Johnny's just been talking about, the fact that the niche of his business is just him. It's an extension of who he is authentically, not made up and just a relay of information. It's stuff that he, he's embodied like for the entirety of his life. And now he's showing people how to live that way. So you're, you're creating your own army environment, essentially, 
right? Yeah, in a way, it's a team. Well, a guy said uh, just the other day, I finished my discipline masterclass, um, which was just a, it was a test really. I was, I've always done physical stuff. But it was just a short four week course um, showing men how to be more disciplined. And I got some testimonials back. Everyone loved it. Everyone was just saying it's enhanced their mindset. And one guy said, um, it was a mate cause he's been on my email list for probably since maybe like April last year when I first started. Um, and he said, it all sounded so perfect. I wasn't sure if you were just kind of reading from books or just, just sounding good. Um, but I did live videos every day. I, I videoed myself doing the challenges. Um, we talked through it like it was real close and it had a private Facebook group on the course. Um, and he said it was awesome to see that you, you practice exactly what you preach. Like you yeah. live exactly how, and of course I do because you, you can't lie about the benefits. Like if you do something, um, and you're not, you're not seeing the benefits yourself. I'm not a good actor. I couldn't, uh, <laughs> I couldn't do it. I'd get, I'd get found out immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love it. Cool. So you went and joined the army. Well, what, what happened from there? So what was the, what was the transition like, you know, from going from how you were, you know, at 19 and kind of getting told, Hey, you can't come back to you know, do carpentry <laughs> because of oh, this, 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 and this, mm. um, you know, so what, what did you, what did you apply to go and join? What, you know, what branch, what was your specialism and tell me about the little bit of journey there. Yeah, sure. So um, I immediately wanted to go to the Rifles just because there was a huge recruiting drive in my area in Somerset, uh, which is why a lot of my friends from Froome, they went to the Rifles. Um, so I went to did that, did the selection down in, what's it, uh, Chepstow in Wales. Um, but then at my last visit to the careers office, he, there was a medical major there and he basically pushed me to become a combat medical technician. He said, this is what you want to do this is you. I'm just like, yes, sir. That sounds perfect. I don't know. You look scary in your uniform. I'll do whatever you say. So, um, went medical. He just, he said, I basically said, I just want to do some soldier. I love being outdoors. I love fitness. He said, this is fine. That's exactly what you'll be doing. Um, except you'll just be the best medically trained on the ground. So I immediately went for it and it was brilliant. Like the basic training, um, is not, um, trade specific anyway. So I really enjoyed it. Real physical, uh, obviously tough demanded in certain areas, but something that everyone could, could easily manage. It's not, um, it just, it kind of separates them more mentally than physically. It's not physically, um, it's not physically as hard as a lot of people would think. I don't think, um, especially if you're active and sporty already. And it went forward. Yeah. And, uh, eventually got, uh, I picked, picked to go to Aldershot. It was in the South. I just thought if long as I'm a couple, couple of hours away from my friends, that'd be good. I ended up never going home though, really. So <laughs> it was pointless. <laughs> um, but yeah, as soon as, as soon as I landed at the regiment, um, that week, the Sergeant Major basically said to me and a guy that I joined with Matt off and they basically said, do you want to go to, um, to Kenya next week? It's fastball, but do you want to do it? Um, we just said, yeah. So we spent, a little while just traveling around Kenya, um, dishing out medical care to all the remote villages. And I was just like, this is exactly the sort of stuff I want to be doing. This is, this is exactly it. Like I'm actually helping people. I I'm knowledgeable. I know what I'm doing. Uh, I'm traveling around. I'm doing something different every single day. Like this is, uh, this is something that I can definitely stick with. And that's when I decided that I was definitely going to crack on and carry on with it. Um, I don't know how much it changed me as a person, I think it, if any, it just made me a more exaggerated version of myself because mm. all I was really was an active kid. Then I immediately had somewhere to channel it. Um, I didn't really like rules and authority that made no sense, but here it was all making perfect sense from guys that I looked up to. Um, it had clear progression. There was no, there's no like, Oh, you can do this and that. It's obviously a clear rank structure. So you know exactly what you're doing. Um, it's very close knit. I've always been a real like a uh, a guy that just loves his friends like always have been or always will be so being in that environment was just insane like i just absolutely loved it um and yeah it was great so I don't, yeah it didn't, didn't change me as a person just exaggerated all my, all my good qualities and maybe helped me deal with my worst qualities such as uh my lack of focus like the army there's certain aspects of it where you have to be focused um so it kind of yeah maybe deal with deal with negatives um, and exaggerate the positives. So it's yeah, <laughs> very beneficial. Nice. Nice. What was the, um, 
What was the worst part about like, you know, basic training and trade training for you? Um, the worst part of basic training, I'm sure everyone will um, will attest. Like as a as a physical aspect of it, it's bare net training. Just the one day of of um, their job is to make you as aggressive as possible in a short amount of time. So, uh, in fact, I'm pretty sure that the sergeant who took us through it um, many many years ago uh, it wasn't allowed to wasn't allowed to teach the bare net training anymore. Um, just because they take it so far. And I, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. I think it was great. Like it was, when you look back, you know that when they say you do something tough, they say you'll look back at this and you'll love it. Like you really do. You look back at that and you just think like, fuck, I was fredders. I was like dirty. I was crawling through stuff that I don't want to mention. Uh, and it was <laughs> like, <laughs> then you look back and you think that was insane. Like I got through that and it was brilliant. And it's not like, it's nothing that, anyone physically couldn't do it's just a te- just a mental test they just know how to do it they they wake you up at two in the morning and it's shock and um it's pitch black and they're dragging you on the floor and it's not nothing that no one can everyone can deal with that but they just have ways of doing it to make you feel very mentally vulnerable so a lot of people um struggle but that is the physically the hardest mentally the hardest part um of basic training uh, there's not there's not really anything too mentally strenuous it's just de- dealing with the the hardships of it just day to day just dealing with it as like a big part is them not telling you what you're doing um like it's it's nothing that anyone can't handle at all it's not um it's not it's not like uh like you watch s c s he who dares wins um i haven't watched it but i've heard it's insane like it's obviously nothing like that that's that's special forces selection trying to mimic that basic training for the army is just making sure that you're mentally strong uh physically capable um it's it's something that everyone can do so as far as that's concerned there's not too much difficult in there the the you feel like it's difficult at the time it's when someone says to you if you think this is hard you wait till you get in the real army you wait till you're there and you just think nah fuck off that's not true it'll be much cheaper <laughs> but you get in and that's when you're that's when it's real pressures like when you're when you're in afghan you've got loads of weight on your back and you've been patrolling for hours uh, and you're in a contact and you're darting around or even just simple things like in the middle of the desert dragging water bottles up to your checkpoint like that's the physically demanding stuff because you have to do it when you look back at training and you thought well i thought that was hard back then you give yourself a slap <laughs> you will yeah got it sweet so what was it what was it like and uh, when johnny says threaders by the way just enlighten the people that don't understand what threaders means uh, just said, pissed oh, off. Absolutely threaders. yeah so just pissed off threaders is um yeah just just really irritated and pissed off there you go you're all learning some stuff now <laughs> some, some army army terminology right <laughs> brilliant so when what about when you went out of area? What about when you went on, you know, detachments? What mm. was what was that like? What did what did that teach you about yourself and other people in the world? So this is a thing that um, that everyone that if if people join as a CA, a combat medical technician, they need to be aware of because the best thing about the army that I loved was being in a tight knit like group of of men, brilliant. But as a medic, you're you're a specialist. So like when you deploy. We deployed, like we were in Kenya all together, obviously giving medical stuff, um, it was great. But when you say go to Afghanistan, the medics that are getting put out on the ground, on the front line, they're getting, they're going to get pushed. You're going to get put with a group of lads you don't know. You're going to get put with, for example, the Grain Guards that are out there when I was there. There's, um, they're all together, like Queen's Company, that's who it was. They were all together, all knew each other, and you're just this one guy and you get put with them. So although you'll very quickly get a, develop a bond with them, which is great, um you need to be aware like in a lot of other units you get that real pleasure of living training and working all the time with that group of men that you trust with your life whereas as a medic you you get moved around a little bit more and that's that's the one thing that i didn't find hard um but it's just it made me like really think like um well, it kind of made me think if any, if I found out someone was joining in as a CMT, a combat medical technician, I would make them aware of that because it definitely just plays us, it, it plays in your mind a small bit. That's what I'd say. Yeah, got it. Sweet. And in terms of experience, you know, while you were out of area, is there anything like uh, significant that you'd, you know, that you'd love to share or tell people about? Um, 
as far as as far as deploying was, it was um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I'll talk about it occasionally to my email list. Um, I was put with. I got moved around a couple of times. They do they do kind of like rotation. So I was with um, different companies of the Grand Guards. Uh, I finished off with Queen's Company, um, which was awesome. Like, and I arrived there. And there was another guy from Froome, which was insane. Um, and do you know I was a uh, I was at a uh, a mob, um, and it was I forgot his uh, Jason guy from Froome. Uh, I saw him walking through the cookhouse, and I was just like, "Shit, that's two guys from Froome," uh, which was insane. So you get little bumps of morale like that. But yeah, on the whole, on the whole, it was great. I learned a lot. Probably learned a lot more than uh, anything I've ever done in my entire life. Um, when you're out there. It's, um, it's physically and mentally extremely challenging, but it's just something that's not even a question of like in training, they're kind of trying to break you like, and you're thinking, will I put up with this? Yeah, I will aggressively moving forward. It's not even a question there. So you just get on with it and you just do what you need to do. Um, and it's a very simple way of living. The lessons I learned out there, I will, I share them. I share those lessons all the time because they're powerful lessons. And that is for the most part, simplicity and what you do when you're out there, you don't have bills to pay you're not having arguments with your your partner or your family or you're not having any little dramas you're not you're not dealing with stupid stuff you did when you were drunk uh, the next morning you're not dealing with money problems you're not dealing with um oh everyone's going on holiday more than me i've just seen it on instagram i'm pissed off now you're not dealing with all this bullshit that 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 takes over your life when you're back here it's simple you go to bed well you go to floor or more accurately you go to sleep um you go to sleep you get up you you carry out tasking. So whether it's a, a draw and destroy operation, whether it's a strike op, or whether it's, it's something that is, as men, it's something that we will enjoy doing, something that fulfills us. It's something aggressive and extremely, um, extremely useful and helpful. You're doing something great. You're doing great things every single day. You're getting to unleash your aggression. You're getting to do it with men that have similar views to you. Um, physically, you'll you're, you're put so much pressure on yourself. Um, I mean, <laughs> physically, the, the pressure you put on yourself is, is like no other. I described it to Amber a few years ago, and I just said, in the green zone, for example, uh, which is like uh, just loads of greenery. It's like there's fields, for example, like where farmers, and there's loose piles of dirt where it would be extremely easy for the Taliban to plant IEDs. So you want to you wanna step over the loose dirt. But I, just, I said to Amber a few years ago, I said, by the end of it, you consider dragging your feet through those mounds of loose dirt because you you just you don't have the energy to to lift them any higher. You just you know that it's uh, you want to conserve as much energy. You just kind of play a little game in your head. You're like, shit, I could probably drag my foot through that and I wouldn't get blown up. <laughs> I reckon. <laughs> uh, you, it's the level of exhaustion you'll reach is just um, yeah. second to none. But there's never a point when you can be like, you can't put your hand up like in training and say, I quit. Like you just, you yeah. just carry on. And as soon as you get into contact, as soon as you hear those rounds going down, as soon as you see like a, a leaf, you're in the green zone, you see leaves getting shredded past your head. You, you're not tired anymore. You jump in. That's when you learn about what your body is capable of. Um, and I say this a lot to people. There's a guy, he died last year, actually, at the Chelsea Hospital. He said um, he was the RSM there, ex-22 bloke. There was a few of us um, visiting Chelsea Hospital. He said that your body is just an empty carcass and it can do whatever you demand it to do. And I always think about that. And that becomes so true when you're exhausted and, and you need to do something. Your body is incredible. Like, like, I think it's David Goggin says, when you think you're done, you're about 40% done. And he's so true. It's yeah. so, so true. Um, so that's, yeah, I guess over there I learned that simplicity is key and what my body is capable of. Um, and yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess they're the two, two biggest ones. I wrote an article, The Six Lessons I Learned um, Fight on the Front Line, which got published by quite a few. Um, got published by Chad Howes, um, Fitmo, uh, J Mac, a lot of these um, big companies. And, and uh, a lot of guys said they, it really resonated with them and they could just simplify their life and, and do these lessons. Um, which is what I'm all about. So it's good to hear. Nice simplifications, everything in every in everything that we do. Um, what? How do you feel towards? Um, I might cut the audience a little bit here, but 
like guys and girls having to go and do a couple of years in the military, you know, go through like a minimum of basic training, per example. Like, like national what? service. Like, uh, yeah, what do, you, what do you think to that? It's a tough one because ev- th- those individuals would benefit from it. Yeah, there's no one that would, be- that would not benefit from doing that stuff. Um, however, that's kind of putting them above the country because our army, well, it's obviously took a hit um, in the last few years um, just because of all the cuts and um, which is insane and the, and the caliber of man that they're letting in now, which is, I hear it all the time um, from blokes saying, Johnny, you would be sick if you saw the blokes that just, just came into the unit. Um, embarrassingly poor standard. Um, but other than that, like we want a great army. And I think if you kind of forced everyone in, then you're going to, you're going to bring it down because at the moment, well, certainly when I joined it, it's, it's good men, it's all good men. And when you're together, you, it makes you better, you know, um, that you're, you're the combination of the five people you spend the most time with. So if you're in a unit with other great men, you become, you want to be fitter, smarter, sharper, all that stuff. If you're with, there's, I mean, if you get a hundred of civilians, normal people, loads of them are going to be great. Um, but there will be some people that, that are negative, that are lazy, that make excuses, that play the victim. And even though they're a small number, they have a huge effect and they can drag other people down. So as much as I think it would benefit people hugely, national service, um, it's still, it's worrying to think what it would do to, to the actual capabilities of the army. And, and also the guys that since they were young have wanted to grow up and be a soldier because they think the army is so awesome. And they get in and just think, shit, it's just a bunch of, uh, people that don't want to be here. It would suck it. for them. Great perspective, dude. Great perspective. Yeah. Okay. So, Okay, so that sent me off on a few other different tangents. <laughs> Brains working. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Yeah, I never, I never looked at it that way. So that, that's, that's opened my mind and eyes up, you know, to someone um, like yourself who's, you know, really been through the depths of it. So the, the article, by the way, that Johnny just mentioned, I'll make sure I, you know, I'll link that in the, uh, you know, in the show notes and description so you can, you know, so you can check that out. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about, why why you left them and what you know what the trend um, that transition you did mention it very briefly when we first started talking but i just want everyone to understand yeah, sure. that. it was um i mean the reason i left was in the simplest terms it was um i mean i always wanted to do a full career i loved the army it was it was the first thing that i was truly good at like uh, even even in, in my regiment um i felt like i was i felt good i felt like other people would come to me for advice. Medically, I had loads of experience from being on the ground that other people maybe didn't have. Physically, I always made sure I was the top. Um, so yeah, I really, I just felt like it was where I should be. But then um, you do, at the end of the tour, you'll do a handover op. So people that are taking over, you'll do an op with them. And uh, I ended up, in fact, I ended up doing two because the, the medic, who I won't name to save him the embarrassment, but a medic who deployed uh immediately went sick um and said he was too ill to go on this his first ever op so uh me counting my chickens i'm home like i'm safe um actually i had to go on another one but it was good because it was the royal marines who were taken over from us as ops company which was awesome so i ended up doing a couple of ops with them uh and i just loved the way they operated um like really loved the way they took control of admin um really good just fighters um soldiers everything i just i really enjoyed being with them. it was a very short space of time uh, and i thought yeah i'd like some of that i didn't just want to do the commando course i wanted to transfer over um because i knew that obviously i'd keep my medical skills because a tri-service qualification so all three services recognize it um so i could be a medical professional i could be a medic in the royal marine so i uh, went through it uh tried tried uh, to join uh, got approved past the um what's it called so it's a three day say again. prmc that's the yeah the prmc uh three days at limpston and you know uh there was a guy at four where i was at at four med who said he who'd done it before and he said mate it's a three-day beasting 
but I was such a <laughs> such an arrogant little asshole I was. I'm just like beasting. Uh, I'll be fine. And I didn't prepare. Yeah, I'm just like, oh, fucking smash it. Uh, and I went there. And honestly, I just underestimated. I thought it's for civvies. I thought this is for civvies joining. Like, get a grip. I'll be all over this. But oh, I was incredibly tough. Three days, real tough stuff. Um, obviously, like there's some aspects like stripping a weapon and naming weapon parts where I could literally just sit back and relax. Uh, all these military skills that uh, they do it at a really basic level for these for this three days. So I was absolutely sweet. But the physical side of things, I did not expect that. It really is to it's a it's basic training level. It's army basic training level. Um, the sort of fizz you're doing, um, which just I mean I obviously didn't do the um, 32 weeks is it 32 weeks Royal Marine basic training but if that's if their pre three days is what the british army's basic is like i can't imagine what their basic training i've heard is uh i've got a lot of friends that have obviously been through it and um yeah and i was desperate to do it as soon as i i passed the prmc um no problem like it was got through it got off of the place uh and then due to an unfortunate accident uh i broke dislocated my lunate bone in my wrist which is a small little moon shaped bone um, and they basically just said, it's not gonna, it's not gonna affect you too much. You'll just never be able to, I'll never be able to do this is basically what it said. So with that wrist, it will never be able to go flat. It just simply where they put two pins in it, like crossing over. Um, and there's, there's no way of it. Like, even if you, if I pull it, it doesn't hurt. It's just that you cannot do it. It just doesn't exist dead, there anymore. Just yeah. dead stop. It's just dead. Um, and I went for my final um medical and adopted in all medicals all military they just say do one press up and you usually just bang one out and they make sure that you that have like three al- elbows or anything like that um and he i did it on my knuckles i just put, went down and did it. he said i need to do it on flat hands and i said oh, i can't i've got this he said well i can't pass you then um and i was just gutted absolutely gutted um so but i i mean i've never been one to ponder on this shit so i just uh, i thought it's fine uh, I can't do that. I'll just make the best out of the army. I'm going to do these arduous courses and stuff. Um, and then I got promoted really soon after that um, uh, to Lance Corporal. Obviously, a private went straight to Lance Corporal. Um, booked in to do the CADA, uh, which you need to do. I think it's it's like 11 days or something. Um, and then I hadn't even considered this, but I, they said, right, well, you just need to do a quick medical for the CADA because it's all out in the field. And I was just like, shit, the same thing's going to happen. And then sure enough, it did. Went to the medical, he said, you can't, I can't pass you on it because you haven't got this. Um, and there's easy ways around it. Like you're allowed to, you can, if, if it's for a medical reason, you don't have to do the card. But to me, that just wasn't enough. Like I couldn't imagine wearing this um, rank that, I mean, if you look, there's, everyone does it, um, which is why people couldn't really understand my reasoning. Everyone, if they're medically downgraded, they'll still happily take the promotions. But I just thought, well, like I said to you before, I, I don't want to be telling people to do stuff that I can't do. So I'm, mm-hmm. I don't want to wear a rank that I haven't done everything that everyone else has done to earn it. So I just yeah. said, uh, I don't want it. Uh, and I signed off. Uh, just You've got to give a year's notice. So I just I said, no, I don't want the rank. I don't, if I can't do the carder, I, uh, I don't want it. So I signed off. I had a year to figure out what I wanted to do, which is where I came up with the original genius idea of security and personal training. Um, <laughs> just popped into my head. Yeah, and then, and then I just, I left, went, went back to my dad's house, slept on his floor for a little while. And, um, and yeah, and, and found, found a gym that would have me. <laughs> awesome. Awesome, dude. And when, when was this, by the way? What, what year did you actually leave? Uh, it was September the 3rd, 2015 was my end date. But I managed to swing it um, so that my personal training course, I, I did for the, my final six weeks while I was in the army. I had a really good relationship with my top corridor, um, all my seniors. like We got on really, really well. Um, and yeah, I managed to swing that somehow. I could do, um, I could do a six-week course while I was still technically in. So I, was, I picked up a wage slip while I was doing that. So that took the edge off massively. Um, which was really good. But yeah, that, that's thanks to them. But then I had a holiday book to kind of celebrate leaving. I think it was Amber trying to cheer me up because obviously I wasn't thrilled about leaving. Um, oh, but yeah, I went on a holiday and was at the airport and uh, I got a call from a gym that I tried to get into and they said, you've got the job. And I was naive to civilian life. So I was like, yeah, I've got the job. Not realizing that in the personal training world, you've got the job means 
you owe us money <laughs> to, to work it out. <laughs> like, Amber, I've got the job. Let's celebrate. Let's spend this money. And then I get back and they're like, your first uh, bill for 400 quid. Here it is. I'm like, you... I, you gave me the job. I don't understand. Um, that was a sharp wake up call. Fuck it out. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that was it. And I was in the gym and then we met. Yeah. God, that was like literally just after mm. you started there. Amazing. Cool. Yeah, when I realized See, I, I, I've, I've learned some more details, you know, despite knowing Johnny for a good few years, I've learned some new stuff myself just now. Awesome. So uh, what, a question that just popped into my mind as well. Again, because I'm thinking about my own personal bias. Do you have a personal bias to how you, uh, you know, speak and treat people that have like been in the military and not been in the military? Yeah, you don't at first because because in when you're in the army, it's such a tight. Like everyone you see, everyone you see sober is in the is in the army too. It's only when you venture out out on the piss that you meet in these other people. So you're not really remembering what's going on. Um, cause that's a big part of obviously being in the army, but then when you leave and you're always around civilians at the start, you assume everyone, um, is, is, um, is, is, has like a, a dark sense of humor. That's the, obviously the biggest one. You assume that everyone has that dark sense of humor. Um, you don't think it's weird to, to kind of, to go and do this, these horrible fizz sessions. You kind of think, well, most people do it. Like you don't. But then you slowly start to learn. You slowly start to realize kind of what's acceptable and what's not. Um, but I kind of steered away from that anyway. I was never a fan of the average behavior. So, And that's a huge thing. My tagline, you'll see it everywhere on my site, my emails, is discipline destroys average. So that pull towards being average around, I kind of feel like, um, like yeah, not doing these arduous phys session, uh, PT sessions, not pushing yourself, not aiming insanely high. It's, it's a pull to being average. And I do everything I can, even to this day, um, of being disciplined that so puts me, gives me an advantage over everyone else. That's what I think it is. So how, uh, how I reacted to them. Yeah, I guess, I guess <laughs> trying to stay exactly what I'd done that had, that had put me up there and not, not kind of give in to the, the pressures, I guess would be a good word for it. Yeah. What, what I tend to find that I, you know, personally do, if I have a, an inkling or a sniff that the other person that I've just met that I'm talking to has, you know, be you know, been in the military or had some experience there. You know, I, I bring it out in topic of conversation. I find out that I'm that I'm right, and then I feel like there's just this instant, like you know, bond between yeah. the two of you. Because all of a sudden, there's that appreciation of the stuff that you've experienced and that you've been through and stuff like that. You know, I don't know if you feel that way too. Um, yeah, yeah. I um, I've been walking outside. This is a few weeks ago, and it, I in uh, in my town. There's, there's no military bases really that nearby. You don't see it a lot. But there was a guy doing fizz in a in a regimental t-shirt. Without thinking, uh, I was looking at him and I was like, "Hey, doing, mate? You're right." Just nodded. And I do not say hello to people. I'm not that friendly. You're up north, so this will sound crazy to you. But I don't <laughs> say hello to every single person I walk past. Um, but but yeah, I just did. I just had this. You just naturally do. You. Uh, you get if, if if Amber's friends, one of her friends, are say uh, just met someone. She's like Johnny. We've got to go on a double date, and I'm just like, oh, what's he like? What's is it? Are we gonna have anything in common? If there's like, a, oh, I think he's in the military. In fact, it doesn't even have to be that. It'll be like, oh, I think he likes walking outside. <laughs> I'll be like, <laughs> oh, fucking hell, we're gonna be best friends. <laughs> You're as excitable as Bert. <laughs> yeah, yeah, big time, big time. I don't know where he is. He just snuck off. Yeah, I am. Absolutely am. <laughs> Wicked. Brilliant. Cool. Okay. So this, this makes a lot of sense. You know, and again, if you, you know, you're listening or you're watching, it, like it's just, there wouldn't be anything else that I personally would, would want Johnny to be doing with his time or his life right now. I think it's just like in, in perfect fitting because basically what you're doing now with, you know, your business, you'd, you'd be doing inside of the army. You'd be yeah. of, you know, you'd be sergeant or, you know, whatever rank, and you'd be mentoring other soldiers and t bringing their discipline levels up and teaching them about life and nutrition and, you know. So it's, yeah. it's, like, it's like almost like a mirror image of what you would be doing regardless of wherever you are in the world. Yeah, 100%. It's something I've always enjoyed doing is like, because um, 
well, like I was in a certain place and then I, and then I got where I am. I've, if I recognize that in anyone else, I've all, before it was my business, I've enjoyed showing them how to do it. In fact, I just text one of my old gladiators. I have an eight week boot camp uh, called Gladiators Boot Camp, which is invite only. It's awesome. I get real close with the guys, like helping them on every level. Um, and I discovered an awesome bit of software to deliver video content because that's something that I, I struggle to find like a really good one, you know, online, some stuff looks great. And then suddenly, um, oh, you can't integrate it with this. And I found it. And immediately, um, I texted him this morning. I just said, um, Joe, I found this bit of software for delivering video. Cause he's got a dog training business, which is, is awesome. Even when I, he was on my boot camp, he was helping me with Bert. Um, really great guy. And I know he's trying to kind of push online a little bit just to give his audience even more value. And I just wanted to reach out to him straight away be like, mate, you need to do this. So now tonight I'm making him a live video showing him this new video software that I've discovered. Um, cause yeah, I mean, that's, you know, as well as I do, that's where the joy comes from is helping someone else overcome something that you have overcome. It's not enough to help them overcome something that you know how to, how they should overcome it. It's not as exciting. Oh, I've heard you should do this. It's when you've done it. And cause you know, the changes, like when I'm bringing people into these small habits that I've done and it's made me it's made, well, it's made me work harder, train harder, treat everyone around me better, just all this stuff. If I can make someone else have that change, because I've done it, so it's the most exciting thing, the most exciting thing in the world. It's just weird that the more you do it, the, the more income you make because you're so much more passionate about it. That's just like an awesome side effect. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. Brother, this has been awesome. I, do, you want, do you know what would be really great? Um, for, for you know, for, again, for the listeners and the watchers, what what two or three things, or maybe just one thing, what can they take away? What things can you give them to go and action that would help them, you know, improve their lives, improve their their businesses, their their daily interaction with people? What's like the the things that you live and die by that they need to be doing? Okay, uh, well, the first one is what I mentioned before about not always looking for the easy option. Yeah, I think the one of the most powerful things that I did this one single thing is I wrote down a list of rules for myself because obviously the army's got rules. When you're younger, the school's got rules. Um, when you're an adult, especially when you're in business, you you make the rules. So it's easy to decide that your rules will be easy stuff that you can always do. It's no good. So write a list of rules. Mine, I've got never be a victim. I've got never make excuses. I've got get rid of stuff that's not relevant. I've got this big list of rules that make sure that I stay on track and live progressively, always moving forward, like never being afraid to take the hard route. If the easy route and the hard route takes the same place and you've got time to do the hard route, then you're going to take that and you're going to become tougher, more disciplined. You're going to feel way more fulfilled at the end. Um, so that's a big one. And then the, the second part is, and this is something that um, I heard, immediately implemented and loved it. Uh, and it's the theory that, we don't take as good care of ourselves as we do other people. Uh, and it's basically because we know all our own flaws. So when I'm giving someone one piece of advice, I say, start viewing yourself in the third person. Start pretending that all the dramas that you've got, whether it's physical and you want to get in a certain shape or mental, you want to be a certain way. Imagine that someone you care about has told you that that's what they want. And then what would you tell them to do? And just do it. When you start treating yourself in the third person, you forget about all your your uh, negatives that you're your dark negatives that you're very aware of. Um, uh, and, and you move past it and you, and you know exactly if, if that's what you'd advise someone else to do, that's what you need to do. So start really caring for yourself um, by doing that and awesome things happen. Um, and that's, yeah. So I guess write the rules down is a big one. View yourself in the third person. And other than that, it's just a simple routine. Like I said about before about simplicity and habits. If you just make sure Every single day, you've got a few non-negotiables that like, you know, obviously when I come and stay with you, I've got these non-negotiables I have to do, um, like a dog walk. I have to do every day. I have to go out and get on a dog walk. Even if we're up north and it's hailing it down, <laughs> we have to get down. We have to, so I got to train every day. And if it's a rest day and I'm exhausted, then I've got a, a flexibility session in front of the TV, but I've got to train all the time. Uh, I've got to get outside and walk the dog every day. I've got to get up at half five every day and do my morning routine of practicing gratitude and all this good stuff. Um, it's, it's things like that, just simple things that, that are going to make you 1% better every single day. So that's, I'd say that's the biggest, simplest, 
quickest advice I can give. Beautiful. Beautiful. So number one was give yourself a list of rules. Create your rules. Don't take don't take the easy route was also something that I heard, right? Take take the harder route. Well, that's one life. of my rules. Yeah, that's one of the rules I just say. Don't always opt for the easy route. Perfect. Number two. Uh, number two, start viewing yourself in the third person, treating yourself as if you are someone that you care for. Boom. And number three. Have simple, habitual, non-negotiables in your day. Love it. Fucking love it. Listen in, do it, action it. JC, awesome stuff. Right, dude, let's uh, let's go through the quick fire questions. Oh, right, I've got some quick fire questions, stuff I want to, you know, <laughs> again, gives everyone a little bit more of an insight who you are and, you know, what you like. Yeah. Uh, remember, remember your swears and all that sort of good stuff. <laughs> you have to tell these these military guys, otherwise they just start spewing swear words out there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Quick fire Sensor. question. Yeah. Quick fire question number one. What is your favorite swear word? <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> but, Liar. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll tell you, but it was strictly against one of your rules, is shit C word as one word. Shit C word as one word is the most satisfying word to say if you're trying to explain to someone who someone is and that person's not a very nice person. <laughs> but feels good. Got it. Quick fire question number two. What's your biggest turn on? reindeer wool reindeer wool yeah anytime i walk past a market stall or a shop and i see that i've got a reindeer rug anytime i just want i just need to touch it just need to be just ah. touch the shit out of it dude you're a hoot quick fire question number three what sound or noise do you love <laughs> the microwave going bing because I know I'm about to scran. <laughs> <laughs> Quick fire question number four. What's the last meal you would eat before you died? This is weird. A bacon, jalapeno, and mayo sandwich. It's my treat. Wow, that sounds intense. It's Reci- so good. Recipe in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> Quick fire question number five. What's your favorite perfume or cologne to smell on others? Uh, the... The woman's Armani code, Armani or the woman's code. alien, or alien. The I'm woman's alien. You've, you've bought that for Amber. Yeah, yeah. Although she likes this really expensive one uh, in a black square, and it's not even nice. And she asked for it, and it was like the double the price of it. I'm like, this better be good. <laughs> I, I'll get the smaller <laughs> bottle, please. It's not nice. Yeah. Don't get I'll that. Get the, alien. Uh, I'll just have the sample. The third. The mil. sample. Have you got a few of them, and maybe a bigger than Evian bottle? I can just pour them in. <laughs> <laughs> quick fire question number six what is the last gift that you bought someone uh yesterday i bought amber a a pedicure voucher he's such a good partner i like it quick fire question number seven are you an early riser or a night owl oh early riser without a doubt i'm ready for bed at like half night <laughs> Same. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> quick fire question number eight tea or coffee coffee these are these are like these are these feel loaded because I already know the answer to all of these. Because yeah. <laughs> you make the best coffee in the world. <laughs> Fuck really? Thanks, Everyone Absolutely. needs to know that. <laughs> Quick fire question number nine. What's your favorite place in the world? Uh Lake Como in Italy. Insane. Nice. Insane place. Yeah. Is that where you and Amber did your uh, bit of traveling? We went through there, yeah. We went there with Bert. It was just uh I mean, I love the whole of it. As my favorite country, the whole of Italy is just insane. Like the culture there, the historic sites, the food. Like if I lived there, it would not be morally right for me to teach people how to eat because I'd be a fat fuck. I would be like, it's just insane. I could easily just go to Italy and never stop eating. The food is insane. Never had anything like it. So yeah. Ooh. Oh, me see. We share like I've I, like the, the Italian food again is like a you know big passion of mine as well. I just love eating. I've I've got a Pavarotti inside of me that's just <laughs> gagging for pasta all the time. Uh, quick fire question number ten: Have we seen your best yet? No, not even close. Not even close. 
You look mildly offended when I asked that. I can't believe you say that. <laughs> Dude, thank you so much. No, it's uh, been a pleasure, mate. The show. Um, just do you want to let everyone know where they can find you, you know, your website and things like that? I will put it in the show notes and the description, so don't worry, people. But it's just great to hear off Johnny, you know, where you can find him. Yeah, sure. So if you go to johnnycollinsuk.com, um, there's tons of articles you're going to find very useful. There's a free case study where I try and show you exactly what you need to do and kind of show you what you're capable of. If you head over to the Instagram, Johnny Collins UK, there you can download a free training program, which if you're male and your goal is to pack on muscle and achieve elite level endurance, um, it's designed perfectly for that. So loads of things you can do. Um, and if you ever need a hand with anything, I reply to every email and I always encourage people to reach out to me on Facebook and Instagram. So please do. Sweet. I feel like I've just been pitched at the AFCO. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> love it. Absolutely love it. Great. And you will most definitely find, you know, Johnny on my friends list. So, uh, you know, if you want to reach out to him personally there, I'm, I'm sure he'd love that, but I'll pop everything into the show notes and descriptions, but uh, JC, thanks so much for, uh, for coming on today. And Cheers um, for having me. Cheers any parting words that you want to give the audience? No, just just cheers for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. It's been a it's been a nice catch up. It's still been shorter than our usual phone calls, but it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I think Amber's arriving home in the next few minutes. <laughs> oh shit! Yeah, in two minutes actually. Two yeah, minutes. Off to London. Yeah, we're doing well. We're doing well. This we're is good. Perfectly. Brilliant. Uh, I'm Rich Wellington from richwellington.com, and you've been listening to the Transformative Sales Podcast. See you on the next one. 